So one of the privileges I have in my role at Red Hat is getting to go talk to customers and partners all over the world across all industries, public sector, telco, healthcare, manufacturing, you name it. And there's some similar themes that come up. So these things that you just heard about uh, from that last panel, all the things that you're dealing with and trying to prioritize and understand how to solve your challenges are common more than you know worldwide. And how people are dealing with those things can vary greatly, but there are some things that I think we can all learn from what's happening that is fairly consistent. So what I thought I would do is share some of those experiences and some of those learnings and some of the things that we've been hearing um, and it really will set a baseline, I think, for the rest of the day as well. As we hear from many people what they're doing, and you start to learn more about technologies and different solutions and how they might be able to help you. So first, I'm gonna take us back in time just a little bit. Uh, for those of us that have been in IT a long time, and um, I started about 25 years ago, and I started in network security. And I think that's a perfect place to start because in the day, we had a wonderful thing called the perimeter, right? And as that started to dissolve and people started to punch holes in our firewall, it's kind of an analogy for what's happened to IT overall, right? Because technology and IT itself has started to become more distributed, more decentralized, and that line or that box where we controlled everything. Remember, if you needed hardware or software, you went to IT, right? If you wanted a new application, you went to IT. But now what's happening as we enter the kind of this, this new digital era, as we like to call it, right, that is all changing. And technology is literally everywhere. And it's not only technology itself, but it can belong to any team. We've heard a lot about developers, right? But many of the functional leaders or lines of business or whatever you want to call it within your organization has technology budget. Many have their own development teams, right? So our ability to control that and having kind of a single um, place where all those decisions are made have changed. And we like to call this digital transformation or business transformation or digital disruption or the fourth industrial revolution or you put your, your moniker on it. But, but the reality is the same. And I like to think about it like this. The digital side is just literally the amount of digital data that we have to deal with. One of my favorite things to ask a group of CIOs or IT leaders is, do you know where all your data is? And if someone raises their hand, just smack them upside the head right now, <laughs> right? Because they're lying. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? Just being able to find it, control it, secure it, manage it, let alone get intelligence from it or insights from it, which is what we're supposed to be doing, right, is overwhelming. Meanwhile, our users, whether those be internal users, our customers, our stakeholders, our constituencies, want these amazing digital native experiences. And so to do that, we're supposed to deliver all these great digital experiences and services in whatever way I, we can, right? Even though we have this huge amount of technical debt like we just heard about. And then the transformation side is easy. Change. It can't be IT as usual. And this is not a new message, right? We've been hearing this forever, that we need to change, we need to move faster, do more with less. But the pace, as we've been hearing about, the pace of that change and how fast technology is moving and how we have to not only just embrace that, you know, but take that and move it further is faster than we've ever seen. And I like to think about it as almost a DNA strand, right? How technology is just imbued into everything we do. And you don't even think about it. We recently just moved into a new house and I found like second day, boxes everywhere. I walk into the kitchen, I'm like, Alexa, right? It's like, what the hell, where'd Alexa go, right? She wasn't set up yet. It didn't even occur to me that we hadn't set up the internet yet, right? Because it's just so inherent. And I will pause just for a moment since I just kind of slipped up and said a little bit of a, a swear word there, that um, there are pools going on among my Red Hat colleagues because I have been known sometimes, rarely, to swear like a sailor, which I have promised not to do today. So that, that was just a small slip, so you're all gonna lose your pool, I'm just saying. We have time? Oh yeah, we have all day. Bets are all off, by the way, after the end of this in the bar, so. So we talk about technology, right, being part of everything, helping us be more successful, 
But really what we're dealing with is so much of the technology and what's happening is disrupting what we're trying to do. Like, can we just go back to those old days where we just had our little box and our network and our applications and our hardware and our mainframes and we could just control it? Right? And it's not just disrupting our work. It is disrupting entire markets, businesses, industries, countries, governments. McKinsey did this great study in 2016 where they looked at new models entering an environment, a market, whatever. And we can really apply this to digital disruption. Because when it first happens, you can completely ignore it. And most people are, right? It's like, oh, there's a blip. Like, remember when Uber first started, it's like, oh, that's so cute. People driving cars. It'll be fine, right? And so you just kind of go along your merry way. And for a while, it doesn't look like it's going to change anything. You're just coasting along, and their lines are going the same direction. And you're continuing to operate and be successful. But then at some point, there's a pivot, right? There's this inflection point where the incumbent hasn't been paying attention. And all of a sudden, we kind of hit that mass adoption. And we go up, and all of a sudden, the incumbent's like, whoa, what just happened? Even though it wasn't immediate. It feels like it because you've kind of been ignoring it and going along your merry way. And it's interesting, um, on the way here, I was reading a book that probably many of you know called Team of Teams uh, by General uh, Stanley McChrystal. And he brought up something very similar to this. And he talked about how it's not that just technology is changing or the way that we are fighting is changing or the people we are fighting is changing. The entire battlefield, the environment, the play field has changed. Right? So if we keep trying to do the same thing, only we're on a completely different field, we can't be successful. Right? The enemy has gone here, and we're still playing over here. I think he did the analogy of it like it's trying to play football on a basketball court. And so if we keep trying to do the same thing, it's not going to work. When I've been talking to customers, I, I've seen a trend over the last few months. And we'd be talking about digital transformation, innovation, technologies, blah, blah, blah. And I got asked several times, so how will I know when I'm being disrupted or if it's happening? And the first time I got asked that question, I seriously just slow blinked because I, I wasn't sure how to respond to that. And I really, it was kind of like that thing where it's like, if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it. It's the same kind of thing. If you have to ask when you're being disrupted, I'm pretty sure you already are, right? Bummer. So we need to think about it as this is not an if. This is a when. And I love the fact that I could literally put different, slide, different logos on this slide every single day. And how people are responding, what new technologies, what new startups are happening. And government is not immune. right? We like to think it's just a private sector industry, you know, issue you know, that is just happening to companies like Kodak. But we'll be fine. We're the government. Right, but even universities, every single part of our, our, our world, our industry, no matter where you are, is being impacted. And we love kind of mocking them, like we all laughed when I said Uber, right? Because we think it's like, oh, those startups, Silicon Valley, it's not relevant. Oh, Airbnb, ruining the hotel industry, you know, whatever it is. And we tend to be a little bit negative. But what's interesting, and I think this, this came up when the CIS was just speaking, you can see things that are happening technologically that could be disruptive to them. Startups that are making it really easy for you to process immigration. Right, but there's a couple things happening. One, the CIS, as you just heard, is embracing their own innovation, right? They are looking to new technologies like containers, like agile ways, DevOps, whatever, to be more innovative. But what if we also looked at some of these disruptors as actual partners, collaborators? I, I saw something recently with one of the nine million national disasters that we've had recently where you know, FEMA was there and there was a startup that was helping send you know, beacons on mobile apps to where people were still you know, in their homes and in flooded waters. And FEMA could react a couple different ways. They could say, oh my god, these startups are just getting in my way. Or you could say, wow, this is cool. We didn't have time to build that mobile app, so let's just use it. So as we look at disruption happening, instead of saying, oh, you know, these disruptors, we could say, OK. What can I learn from this, and is, is there a potential collaboration? Which I know is a cultural shift, too, which we're going to talk about. And there is a reality 
that isn't true for every industry. And the disruptors, disruptors often don't have to deal with it, which is they are not caring about securing an entire country and populace. Right? So that mission and that incredible responsibility is not on their mind like it is yours every single day. So how do we embrace that knowing that there are many things we just can't compromise? So my question to you is what would you do differently today if you acted like you were being disrupted? Would you bring in a team of developers? Would you go do that worming exercise? That's, I'm going to use that word next time. You know, go hide two weeks and bring everyone together. Would you invite some of these startups into your agency or your, your environment and say, hey, you know, work with us, help us learn? What would you do differently? Or even better, what if you were the disruptor? And maybe you're not disrupting an industry or a sector or a market, but what if you disrupted yourself? What would you do if you acted like a disruptor or like Yoda? And we love to talk about disruption as if it's bad, it's negative, oh, they're disrupting the world, whatever it is. But disruption, and as you think about how you can disrupt yourself or embrace disruption, it can actually be good. And I love this example from the government of Singapore. Granted, small country, so maybe more to control, but they have all the same issues that we have, just on a smaller scale. And they found that there were a lot of people dying because they couldn't get to the hospital fast enough when they had a heart attack or they fell down or had a severe injury or whatever it was. So they asked the community for help, like, what do we do? And they kind of built this innovation hive or hub, kind of a hack fest environment. And they ended up coming out with a mobile app where anyone that is a trained responder, so it could be a paramedic, a nurse, a doctor, but also anyone certified, say, in CPR or that you know, knew how to work a defibrillator or whatever, could be part of the system. And then if someone said heart, had a heart attack in the middle of a park, Anyone that saw that or if the person was still able to can you know, activate this app and the nearest responder shows up. And what's happened is they've literally saved dozens of lives of people that got help and someone saving a life while the emergency services came and took them to the hospital. And it's funny because this gentleman spoke at our Red Hat Summit a few months ago. And I can tell you, like at most tech summits, you know, you don't have tears in the audience. But literally everyone in the room was kind of like, you know, trying to hide the snuffles because it was such a powerful story. And that was technology that enabled that. And I think his quote is perfect. This wasn't about technology for technology's sake. This was about using technology to make people's lives better. And isn't that why we're all here? I mean, most people that I know that go into the public sector think because they can make the world a better place. I mean, that's actually why many of us are in technology. And here's an example of where it actually came true. And the reality is your constituency wants you to do social good. In, in fact, it's become an imperative, hasn't it? It's not enough that you just keep the government running. You need to make a social impact make things better. And this is especially true for those lovely 100 plus millennials that are the next generation of leaders. And I say this with some level of experience in that all five of my children are millennials. And it's not enough that you, you know, feed them and clothe them, right? They want you to buy organic vegetables. <laughs> and they want you to pay for it, let me be clear. So when they want you to make government do social good, they want you to pay for it. Um, and they don't want to work more than 40 hours a week. But the reality is, we have to be thinking about this, right? It's not enough just to keep the wheels on the bus, right? That bus needs to save lives and be green and have ramps and do all those politically correct things and make people get along. So where are you on this journey? We talked uh, with you know, the people that were just there, and they said, what, are the, what is the lessons that you can provide on your journey? So we all have lessons, and we're all at a different stage. And I know no one likes to be called a laggard, 
um, and I probably should come up with a better word, but this framework that I build out kind of is the reality of what I'm seeing across the world, across all industries, is that you've got people that just can't get out of their own way. And they know they've got to innovate. They know they've got to move faster. And then you've got folks that have gotten it. Like they're starting to transform, and they're moving faster. They're becoming more agile. And they just got to keep it up, right? And then you've got this rare group, and this is a very small percentage. Call them whatever you want, early adopters, whatever you, know, whatever you want to categorize them. And their biggest challenge is how do you keep that pace? And so as you think about where you are, your priorities are different. And at the end of the day, it's all about how do I get to innovate more? And we can get stuck in this continuous optimization froth. It's so easy to operate from scarcity, isn't it? Because we have been told for God knows how many decades now, do more with less. You've got to cut cost. I was meeting with a bank in the Netherlands not long ago, and the CIO said, I don't care about containers. I have to cut $72 million from my IT budget, or I don't have a job tomorrow. Right? And that is the reality many of us deal with. So how do we deal with that cost cutting, deal with that efficiency, and shift it so we can innovate? Is there a way we can do both without ripping and replacing, right? We can't just throw our technical debt out the window and buy a new shiny car. So how do we think about this? How do we think about moving towards this innovation? And the word that I keep hearing from people, and it came up today already, is agility. And it's interesting because a few years ago it was all about efficiency. I've got to get more efficient. I have to gain more efficiency from my IT. And now everyone's saying, how do I get more agile? How do I act more like those disruptors? So what do digital leaders do? Those guys that are up on the top right side, what are they doing differently than everybody else? One is just moving faster. And this is hard, right? It's hard to move fast, even for small companies, let alone entire public sector agencies, right? And it's not moving fast as if you're taking this whole elephant and trying to you know, move it forward. How do you think about it in these small bites? How do you think about an iterative, agile kind of mentality? Because at the end of the day, the other thing high performers or digital leaders do is they're deploying more frequently, right? Truly CICD, agile, scrum, whatever you want to call it, right? They're, they're updating things in a much more agile way. They're also using open technologies. And obviously, this is going to be a theme of the day, open first. But that's truly, if you look at most disruptors, it was open source behind that technology that enabled them to so quickly disrupt a market or an industry. So how do we get there? And this is not everything, but let's talk about these three areas, right? Obviously, technology is one piece of it. How we, process, how we do our processes, processes across organization, and culture. And culture is one of those things that almost gets a bad name, right? It's kind of like, oh, you know, let's all you know, hold hands, sing kumbaya together, and you know, we're so happy. We can't all be these nice, happy cultures. But at Red Hat, culture is something that we talk about all the time. And believe me, it's not because we don't want to be profitable, and we don't want to make money, and we don't want to serve our customers, and we don't want everybody to you know, change the way they're doing things and be more successful. It's not a self-serving culture in that way. But we talk about it because we know that this, we were born out of open source culture. It's who we are. And if we lose that, you know, then we lose sight of why we're here. So what is the culture of your organization? And how does that relate to how you are transforming how you use technology to be successful? And we talk about this in terms of transparency, collaboration, socialization. I love the example. I can't now remember. I, I think it was um, Matt that was talking about this in the beginning, Matt Lero, who was saying, we actually are bringing people together and socializing these ideas. And I thought to myself when he said it, I'm like, that is not a description I think about 
when I think about the federal government. It's like, oh, let's all get together and socialize this. Now, at some point, someone needs to make a decision, so you can't just socialize till the cows come home. But how are you kind of enabling that different level of collaboration where everybody feels they're a part of it? And I will tell you, that's not just your constituencies, but you know, your developers want to feel that they're part of something. We're going to talk a lot about developers and their changing role, but in the reality is they want to feel like they're building something special, right? And meanwhile, your ops guys need to feel like they're not just stuck in the trenches. So how do they get involved in this innovation too, even if they're keeping the mainframes running while you transform, right? So it's empowering everybody to feel like they have um, a chance to participate in this transformation. Process. How are you thinking about process changes? Agile, continuous, we talked about this, this iterative type of thing. And it's gotta be across the organization. It can't be just development processes. We get really stuck on this DevOps thing as, as if we're ignoring everything else. But there's so many other processes that we need to take into account. And every time you change something, chances are there's an IT business process behind that that you also need to update, right? So it's not just that technology alone. And moving to technology that is open, integrated, hybrid. We talked about this a long time. And open source is truly the source of that innovation. And as Paul mentioned, Red Hat has built its entire company on taking open source from the community to the enterprise, to the public sector, in a stable, secure, supported, reliable way. And the thing I always think about is you can go straight to the community. And in fact, many, many of our customers collaborate and influence what is happening at the community side. Right? They are very involved in that. And, it, and there's a great reason to do that, because you can influence what's happening at the community level. But few companies can consume the chaos that would come if you were just taking that open source code and putting it straight into production. Right? And that's where partners of Red Hat and companies like Red Hat come in, where you get the innovation, you get that speed, that agility, but you're getting it in a way that is supported and secure. And you, some of the terms that, that Paul and Larry talked about, you know, about choice and, and security, I like to call it open, trusted innovation, or trusted open innovation, whatever. That, that combination of trust, like you've gotta be able to trust it. You've gotta be able to make it secure but it is that openness, and importantly, it's bringing that innovation that you need to be more agile and succeed. And it's not just the code. Culture is a critical part of this, because you can't just take new technology and not change the way you're doing things. And we've tried that before, right? There's been many instances where we're like, oh, I'm gonna try this new shiny thing, but we don't change the way we're doing it, and we just end up in the same place. And we're back in IT optimization, where all we can do is try to cut costs and move what we have a little bit better. And we're not actually getting to where we need to be. And I wanna share an example um, from our cousins to the north, uh, from the Pacific Northwest, near where I live, that, and we, we're seeing this in, in more and more governments. And in fact, something was, was brought up this morning about bringing in you know, kind of a hack fest type of mentality in government. And this is exactly what these guys did. And let's just hear from them for a second. As you can see, they were one of our Innovation Award winners. And I'm seeing more and more of this all over the world. There was an example in the UK where it was something very similar, where they brought in members of the community to help them innovate and build new applications faster and improve uh, constituency services, public services. Singapore, that was another example. It's happening here. Um, really, this is a trend that's happening all over the world to kind of you know, bring in the community. And what you find is there are so many people that want to do this. If you've ever been to one of these hack fests you know, where for two days people try to create things together, it is incredibly powerful and exciting. And you realize everybody focused on a, on a single goal um, really does make a difference, and we can uh, do things together. So at Red Hat, our vision is what we call the open hybrid cloud. And when we talk about openness here, it's not just open source. This is about interoperability you know, across the stack, so to speak, across all areas of technology. Um, and it's about you know, open API infrastructure. It's about things playing nice together, right? And importantly, 
It's about portability, the fact that your applications can move across traditional infrastructure all the way up to public cloud. And how do you allow that portability with still the same security policies and controls and, and consistency, um, but enable you to kind of align the workload with infrastructure that is appropriate and that can scale the way you need it to? So that's kind of the vision and how we're moving forward with our customers. Because the reality is the future is absolutely not only hybrid, but multi-cloud. And we have customers today that are already using multiple public clouds with private cloud, with their traditional infrastructure. And I like to almost think about it as there are things that, that allow that flexibility, and then there are areas or fabrics of your architecture that you need to be thinking about consistently. You know, and that might be you know, containers, Linux containers, and the operating system behind it. It might be the virtualization layer. It may be integration. How are you consistently integrating these things or using APIs to allow that portability, but still with some level of management control and consistency? You know, how are you making sure your policies are consistent across that so you can you know, make sure that you are having the access controls that you need? So I like to think about is there are areas where I can have that agility and really move fast, and then what are those pieces or fabrics where I need to have that support and stability, but still have the future and the scalability I need? So in closing up here, my question to you is, we could stay the way we've always done it. Stay in our IT department, stay in our agency, stay in our little vacuum and do it alone, continue to crank it out and try to make a difference and hope that we get new talent and hope that we can you know, recruit people and retain and motivate our staff. Or we could do what we're talking about today, which is take advantage of this amazing community of partners, each other, people in the community, open source communities, your constituencies, your customers, all working together to try to deliver better services. And just as context, you're gonna hear some of them today, but Red Hat is working with literally hundreds of public sector organizations across all the different areas of that industry, not to mention other industries, literally worldwide. So my invitation to you is to take this opportunity to collaborate with each other today, uh, with Red Hat, with our incredible partners whose logos you saw on that screen that we work very closely with in the government, and see if together we can make a difference. And I know this is a little hokey to end, but I am truly an optimist, and regardless of things that are happening in the world and the nation right now that test our faith in humans, I refuse to be defeated on this because I really believe that technology and everything we're doing can change the world. And I think we all have to believe that, right? That is our mission, and that's what gets us up in the morning. And I truly believe that IT, in doing this, can be the heroes. So with that, thank you, and I hope you enjoy your day.